So our next speaker is really hurting. Yeah, I was going to give you one. So <laughs> our next speaker is really hurting cats on a massive scale. To continue with the animal analogies that have been everywhere today, uh, Paul Evanson is the founding uh, founder and executive director of Social Innovation St. Louis. And they are working on so many interesting initiatives in St. Louis. But I had the pleasure to meet and participate in a gathering where they started thinking about this idea of a regional strategy to social purpose real estate. How do we think about uh, creating a network of nonprofit centers, a network of spaces in the community? So I'm really pleased to share, to turn the mic over to Paul. There we go. Um, greetings from Arch City. And before I jump into any detail, details about my beloved St. Louis, I actually want to start by turning your attention right here to Denver. Take a peek at this picture. I hope you've seen it before. This is downtown Denver, right, from about where the uh, baseball stadium is down to Capitol, right? Uh, and this is straight from the NCN website. And each of those pinpoints is a member of NCN most of which are nonprofit co-location centers, right? So all of you not from Denver in comparatively less center, uh, not as center rich, <laughs> might look at this map, by the way, uh, that one's us, right, right now. Might be looking at this map with a bit of envy. Wow, what an abundance of resources. But also ask some pretty critical questions. In St. Louis, we're much earlier in the co-location and nonprofit center as a strategy to strengthen our sector and to produce outcomes. And so we look at this map and we ask some different questions. How did Denver know it needed 13 centers in such a small geographic area? Why did it decide to place them where it did? How did those locations advantage either the mission of the co-locators themselves or community development? From the incredible investment this must have taken to produce what were the expected outcomes, and how's that going? These are the questions we've been asked in St. Louis as we look ahead to bringing this powerful strategy to strengthening our nonprofit sector. How many do we need? Is this a real estate question or a community question? Is this a social outcomes question or a space needs question? And if it's all the above, how do you sequence those questions to produce an ideal result, an optimal use of capital, strengthen nonprofit sector, contribute to community development? These were kind of hard questions. And so we eagerly look to the many cities who have been down the path further than we um, for lessons on what you've seen. And then we've had to devise some of our own solutions. And so what I want to share with you is how did we go about trying to answer those basic questions? And why do we have an emerging network of nine centers? Why that number? Why were they located? What do we hope to gain? So maybe it's the view from the youngest in the room, as opposed to the view that you just heard, which was from those with far more experience and sophisticated tools. For those of you from certain faith traditions, you might also recognize the irony in Paul following Saul, but that's a different story. <laughs> so St. Louis, uh, my beloved Arch City, it's not where I grew up, it's not where I'm from, but it's my home and I love it and I'm not moving. And so when you commit to a place, you ask these longer term questions and when you might not be a permanent resident, and I am a permanent resident of St. Louis. And so where we started first in asking these questions, actually, was with this one. What values should guide social purpose real estate as a framework for these, what can be competing challenges, intentions, and interests, and how to maximize them? And to answer that question, um, we didn't presume we knew the answer, so we talked. We invited Katie, <laughs> we invited Sherry McGill, we invited many people, um, and thanks to our partners at the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve Bank um, <clears throat> and their community development office, we hosted a major conversation earlier this year and we asked a group of funders and developers and real estate agents and nonprofit leaders and community leaders of all types. Um, <clears throat> and we broke into groups and we produced a product, and several of them actually, and the first of which is uh, what strategies and uh, what values should guide our strategies. And here is, and we can, we're happy to share the result and the worksheet that we use to work from that says what does it mean to implement that, that, that value, what's it look like in action, and what's its implication for our practice. 
But in brief, I want to highlight a couple of things that for us, what is nonprofit co-location about? First of all, it's community-centered. This is about strengthening the myriad of neighborhoods that make up our region. First and foremost, it's not about real estate. It's about family and community. How will our real estate investments further measurable outcomes in that way? It is absolutely relationship-driven, high trust. And for us, that means relationships precede the buildings. If nonprofits don't have a relationship before they get to the building, it can be much more difficult to create one once you're there. We're big on creating the glue before we invest in the bricks as to why we should be co-located. What mission um, outcomes are we trying to maximize? How do we find the partners and bring them together? And who can facilitate those conversations in an honest way before we invest in where we're going to be together and how that enables all of the above, right? Puts a little squared sign <laughs> and takes a one, right, or two and makes it a much bigger number. Mission focused. We are here to produce mission benefit, mission outcomes. We'll get to that in a second. I want to spend a little more time on the notion of what we mean by equity, and specifically what it means in St. Louis. We mean equity, and we mean racial equity. And by that, we mean a future state where race no longer predicts outcomes. Right now, every system we have in our community, its outputs and outcomes can be determined by race. And this is not acceptable, not just morally, although that is enough, right? But for all the other bottom line consequences of that, what that means for St. Louis, it harms us all. It disproportionately and historically has harmed our neighbors and friends who are people of color. And for us, our real estate investment strategy has to dive directly into our inequities and seek to say who gets to decide, how are we accountable to people of color and communities of color, especially in patterns and neighborhoods where we have actively disinvested for years in the resources necessary for life. That's our reality in St. Louis, and so it's through that lens and why we hold up these values is what we want to be accountable to. Accountability, you just heard me say, and of course, sustainability. And I think some of these would be more intuitive than others, depending on your community's history and experience. So we drive these, these values into action in some very specific ways. And that is, so what results? These are our guiding values, and you can see that they commend certain kinds of results and how we would know if we've achieved them. Right? We asked, what results do we explicitly expect from an investment in social purpose real estate in the form of nonprofit center co-location? Uh, the first is we had to get clear on what are the mission benefits to individual nonprofits. Like, what is it you will get measurably out of this strategy? And usually they want more than one mission benefits, clusters of things they want, right? But they are the flags, if you will, we start planting at each of these centers and saying, this one is, like we've often heard, a themed center. If you're about this <laughs> and aligning to achieve, then this is your place. This one's about access. We're trying to make sure that there is a wraparound, integrated, person and family centered, easily accessible set of resources essential for quality of life. And if this is your population, if this is your neighborhood, <laughs> if these are your partners, then this is where you can go. Some were less intuitive to us. If you're struggling with your business model, replication and assuring quality at scale, right? These kinds of challenges in nonprofit programming. If it's about revenue and business, we've got a place for you too. And so there's all kinds of mission benefits people are trying to optimize. We needed to name what they were. And by naming them, suggest and commend to people who gets called into service in these places. Because it's part of what helps us sort out how many we need and where they belong. Because sometimes having two centers on the same block could be perfect. And sometimes that's a sign that we didn't do our homework, right? How do you know? There's a big difference between those two. And so we have a doc, we have working tool we have on what are the mission benefits, how do you know, what does that mean for nonprofits, what they should think about, et cetera. But it's trying to, if you will, play Plinko and make sure we sort folks, right, as much as we can, with as much forethought as we can. And this speaks to my earlier comment about creating the glue before we start laying any bricks between the nonprofits and why they need to be together and being clear on the mission benefit, and that we can begin to activate a lot of that mission benefit in advance of co-location and know that then it becomes exponentially more powerful upon co-location. So our values led to and helped us make clear on our measurable benefits we intend to achieve. A second one is we're here explicitly to invest in the social and economic development of our neighborhoods and communities. Boy, does this raise questions we don't have answers to. How do we avoid gentrification? At the same time, in my highly distressed neighborhoods, how can nonprofits be early actors in redevelopment? Right? Where I may not have a for profit enterprise that needs a certain amount of foot traffic or something else viable on this corner, how do I make sure my nonprofits are putting their rent money behind their mission with where they are and how they're spending that precious resource? 
How will neighbors benefit? And the third is we're trying to increase the overall capacity of our region's social sector. We have, like most regions, really insane ambitions. Like grand vision for St. Louis 2040. Like you hear these things, right? And every one of them are actually, I think, very compelling and legitimate for what the quality of life will be like and neighborhoods will be like, what our future could be, right? This is essential. I don't demean it at all. But if we're really honest in St. Louis, we don't have the chops. We got the passion, but we ain't got the precision. And so if we don't start investing in the infrastructure to do the work, right, and be honest about those costs, we don't have the capacity to go all the way back to some of the sessions said this morning, right, the capacity for collective impact, if that's the language you want to use for this approach. And so we're trying to say, how do we use social purpose real estate to strengthen the infrastructure across our region to have the muscle to do the lifts we have in mind to accomplish together over the next 20 years? And so these, that's what we want from our real estate strategy. We want to be able to realize our values in action and achieve mission benefits for our co-locating nonprofits to improve the quality of community life and economic opportunities within those communities and to strengthen our social sector and its ability to help us realize our shared aims. That's why we're investing. So who's doing it? And I'm never going to speak without getting the chance to shine the light on some of our community champions that help give life to and explain how this story gets played out real time. So I'm going to start in an interesting place with Maxine Clark. Now, this is a nationally known <laughs> innovator and entrepreneur. Um, she's the one that started Build-A-Bear Workshop. Right? Interesting, right? <clears throat> Later in life, driving in her car with a grandchild in the back seat and an activity they did together around a bear became a company. All right? And she's a powerhouse, not only of a vision of what can be, but of being able to get things done. And she has taken on the redevelopment of a hospital, a half a million square feet that will become the hub of our hub and spoke network of collected, uh, connected nonprofit centers. The majority of our actors in this space are people who come out of faith traditions or are part of communities of faith. This is true in St. Louis in particular because they have the best ear to the ground and trust with our communities to tell us what they need, where they want it, and how it has to happen for them. So that that leads the process, even when in the end it has every time cost us more in terms of real estate, it has instead produced community. Because it's one thing to have a center in a community, and it's another for the center to become the center of the community. <laughs> These are different things, right? And sometimes you have to take a more expensive path to get to the result that reflects community's genuine interests. So Bishop Luther Baker. Men of Valor has 13 uh, nonprofits who want to come together in response to what he understands his community needs in Wellston, right? <clears throat> Co locate because that's what the community asked for. Uh, that can be a powerful opportunity. Uh, Pastor Andre Alexander, and uh, he is working um, interesting, different kind of real estate there. These are some smaller homes that they first rehab to create jobs and training skills opportunities for their neighborhood. But there's also a couple of very small commercial buildings they intend to, on the same corner of a street, basically, is a redevelopment effort here, being led by a local church and a community development corporation that they created. Uh, <clears throat> Josh Wilson, these are names that are becoming very familiar to NCN. <laughs> And because we invited them to town and we said, look, there's help. Get it. <laughs> Let's learn from everyone who's done this before. And they've been reaching up and pulling down. Oh, I could use some consulting. I could use some support. I'm excited by that. Um, here is a not-for-profit started out of a church that, quite frankly, failed in its first efforts to create real jobs and economic opportunity. Programming did not go well. And through that series of lessons and staying on mission and passion and listening, they've actually evolved a wonderful organization that's very effective. And now they are an accidental landlord, <laughs> a large building kind of on purpose. <laughs> they went in on purpose knowing it's too big, and we're going to have a theme center around workforce development with the partners we already work with and trust, but we could really make this easier for those we claim to be accountable to by being all in one place and treating people as whole people, not individual issues. Because workforce development is many things that they have to unpack together. You may know Starsky Wilson. The Reverend Starsky Wilson is a president of the Deaconess Foundation and the co-chair of the Forward Through Ferguson, the Ferguson Commission. And he is, has taken his foundation out of a high-rise downtown and into the community and created a center for child well-being and co-located some essential nonprofits to put them on solid long-term footing to be able to advocate for, produce the data that we need to be accountable for child well-being. 
probably someone who's been in the game longest and an unsung hero in our community is Diane Drollinger. And she has a really cool program called Strong Start. How do you incubate or shore up very small and early stage nonprofits? How do you help them make the decision whether they should become a nonprofit or they should merge with somebody else early on, right? And so that program of co-locating nonprofits and growing their, and, and the whole purpose is building their capacity with this very structured set of programming. And it's been wonderfully successful and we want to do more of that. Just two more real quick. Um, I refer, because I don't know what's the most respectful way, when both people in the family uh, are pastors, so the pastors, Jenkins, uh, <laughs> Beverly and Ken, um, we're redeveloping a strip mall in Ferguson that's assuring access to childcare, banking services, and a number of other things, and has been vacant. But here's a case where if community is first, sometimes you make decisions that are financially hard. So this strip mall has been vacant for 12 years, and the community's been crying out for what it could be. And this church agrees to this redevelopment opportunity. And the landlord lives in another city. I'm being so polite to not name names. It just kills me not to. Uh, <laughs> lives in another city. <clears throat> and it had been vacant. And so they came up with the money. They raised the money. They say, we'll give you your asking price. And the moment he found out somebody was interested, he raised it by a million. And so they responded saying, well, OK, we'll move up the street. We could do it someplace else. And they said, no, we're not moving. <laughs> you don't get to just move. This is our community. This is where we need these services. This is where we have to redevelop. So if that means we have to raise a million more, let's raise a million more, because this is the community. Right? If we had been purely real estate driven in the sense of the bottom line of the business model, right, we likely couldn't have or wouldn't have made that decision. But if we're going to be community driven and then tap into the community's willingness to help us meet that challenge, then we create centers and spaces the communities own right, and have named as being important to them. I think that's a good example. We're very reliant on David Desai Ramirez at our CDFI, the Illinois Facilities Fund, and their growing capacity to advise our nonprofit community, lend, uh, and make sure certain centers even can happen, as you were saying, by buffering <laughs> the time between how long it takes to build trust and raise money in the nonprofit community, get clear on mission and set up those mechanisms, and real estate transactions, which um, couldn't be farther apart. And so these kinds of, what we found are a number of community champions had done the homework to understand what did neighborhoods need? What flags are we flying, right? What mission benefits are we gonna maximize? And assemble them into an intentional hub and spoke network of spaces. That is a redevelopment strategy using nonprofit investment, right? As a vehicle for communities. And how are we trying to connect them? The connections programming, in some cases, people are choosing that my headquarters will be in the hub, but now I can do programming and a number of places I couldn't before. Sometimes it's just in one place, right? But they have reciprocal privileges so that my swipe card works here, works there, and I know I'm welcome <laughs> in places I otherwise may not have felt welcome, in places outside of my own neighborhood. There's a lot of ways that we mean literally a hub and spoke connected network of intentional spaces designed to give an architecture for our social sector to meet the needs of specific neighborhoods and our regional outcomes we're trying to achieve. This raises a lot of questions for us. How do we champion these centers individually and collectively? How do we share risk when we think about real estate? What joint financing mechanism, mechanisms might be ex available to us that wouldn't be available individually? Can we attract the attention of investors as a concerted strategy together that might not pay attention to us if we were small and individual in one neighborhood. Conversely, we have people who care about specific neighborhoods and specific outcomes. How do we activate that? So we're wrestling with some of the tensions between the, you know, the pie is abundant and the whoops, <laughs> that constant tension of how do we raise the resources for this? And we're trying to explore that. Um, <clears throat> as a network, can we re access resources nationally that are outside of an individual center's reach if they're part of a network? and what they intend to learn together. Don't know, we hope. And how are we going to continue to build and sustain strong connections between these centers as an intentional network, right? Not as just a standalone effort. Not easy questions. So this is our map. You can, like my mom would say, squint at it. It's like the Christmas tree. It looks better if you kind of squint at it. All right. You don't have to know the particular details, other than, of course, our boundaries aren't mountains, they're rivers. Right? We're up against the Mississippi. You see that big blue slash down the middle. Right? Not the only river in our town. And you can see a pattern of centers where there's a hub, and there's theme centers, and there's access centers, and there's different kinds that is emerging across mainly central and north city. And this reflects, quite frankly, the communities we've historically disinvested in. And so it's an intentional reversal of that pattern. And we're trying to connect them from the hub out to the spokes, and between the spokes. And if you have a program in your space for workforce development and job training, how come it's not also available in the other space so people don't have to travel across town for it and all those kinds of things, right? 
And so if you just keep making these connections happen as we are now, you end up with a network, and if you squint at it, it looks like social innovation. <laughs> <clears throat> I don't know how innovative that is. It's just what we're trying to do. <laughs> that's what I. That's why I brought everyone here to, today. There's. It doesn't look like innovation when you do it on a day-to-day -day basis, but on the outside, it's a very different picture. So, what questions do we have in the room for Paul? Um. So I find it really interesting that. All of the leaders that you pointed out were leaders that came from communities of faith. Um, most. Mo okay, most so. Mm -hmm. um, what structure or entity um, brought them together? Have they ever been brought together? Is there a network? That's our role. So why does social innovation have a role? We're not a community. We're, we don't know for anything for real estate. What we do, right? It's like, what? Okay. Uh, this is one of five strategies we're responsible for managing in St. Louis, and that is the infrastructure strategy. All of them related to strengthening the ability of our social sector to help us achieve these outcomes. Right? So our role, uh, we're convener, we're neutral. So we have nonprofits we've been convening for two years pre-planning for their co-location and some that are just starting. Some where their co-location and what they intend to do together is just this side of merger and acquisition. Like they're getting really tight in what they do. And others where the purposes of co-location don't require that and so the planning they're doing is different. So we're often asked by those people who are making these projects happen to convene the not-for-profits and help them do the pre-planning and come together. Secondly, it's our job to put these people on the map. Does the region, whole region, recognize the emerging network? And this goes back to equity of access to resources and being available to pull down the resources that they need. And that took the form of understanding where they were in the pipeline of developing their project and making sure we are helping them get access to the supports they need for their project to succeed. Got some complicated actors who already got their, you know, new market tax credits and all that's great. And some people way back here going, I dream a dream. I know we can do this, right? So based on where you are, what supports do you need? So second role we had was to try and call down and connect them to the supports they needed for their projects to succeed. And the third is to convene them and ask these questions. This is still on a horizon late this year and into next year. Uh, what's in it together? What are the tensions, right? But again, as someone who's in between, and that's our job to be in between. That's all we do. Um, <clears throat> How do we help them answer those questions? So those are the roles we play. Um, maybe I missed this, so forgive me if I did. I'm curious about your genesis and how you are funded. So essentially, like how, how did your group come to being and who are your biggest champions mm. aside from the folks you're corralling? Uh, interesting. So um, social innovation, the notion of, of a social purpose real estate strategy for our region is one of many things that we're trying to advance. Um, and it came out of our understanding of the things our social sector was telling us they need. We've got a strategy around program quality and organizational capacity, the ability of partnerships to perform. Uh, we have tech and startup and <laughs> a lot of things we're doing with technology and social entrepreneurship, right? These are the things we're asked for. And then one of them is Spree, Social Purpose Real Estate. We're a startup. Uh, we get to say we're two now, which makes you sound so much more mature than months. Telling somebody you're 17 months old is like, you know, a good way to dead end a conversation, right? So at least we can say we're two. Um, <clears throat> We purposefully sought funding that, were not, that was not sources our peers would rely on. So our funding is not from our local foundations, et cetera. Quite frankly, we have startup investing from entrepreneur investors who are intentionally hands off and allowing us to play this role. Because what we said is we think we know the questions, but we're really uncertain of the answers and they're not ours to decide. Let us go ask and be an honest broker to act on the answer. And if you'll let us do that, we'll be able to play an important role in our social sector that doesn't currently exist. And they bought it. And so we have that flexibility. And so um, we didn't have to. I, I, I will be fine next year if this strategy doesn't work. Like we don't have some grant somewhere that says we have to have so many centers and plan on this cycle. What we have is go ask these questions of your community. Be prepared to respond to the answer and help facilitate its implementation. I think we're lucky. I hope we're responsible with that rare opportunity. I have a question online. Um, what has been the response of the city and county to this effort? Oh, so supportive. Something you need to know about St. Louis, um, there are lots of little parts you can add up. There are 80 some municipalities in our county. That excludes the city of St. Louis. 
right? Which is not in a county. It's, it's one of the few, one of those rare municipalities that's sort of its own entity. Okay. Uh, and so one of the things that people worry about in St. Louis and is a watchword for us is fragmentation, right? And we're delighted by the fact that we have gotten so much support for this idea, even if they are some of the best hard questions we've gotten. How do we think about this more carefully, more precisely? What have we not considered? But so far, the response has been enthusiastic and supportive. A bit of surprise. I'll be honest with you, people ask for a lot of partnership often before they're prepared to support it. And in the social sector, we find this a lot. We'll do a lot of homework inside to really get our game together and do exactly what we thought funders asked it for. And they're like, yeah, we're actually really not really ready for that level of collaboration. And we're not so sure we want you to get to decide through these new decision-making structures. That's kind of not how we normally gave money. We decide, right? Like, it's really been an interesting tension. And I think that's true of the, you know, of, of, of the field generally in terms of our, where we're moving to and how we're working together. But um, I've been pleased by the response. I'm grateful for the response. In fact, I snuck out and missed the chance. I wish I'd been here to have lunch with you all around working with one of our cities who happens to have people here today. So we met for lunch across the street to work on this project. Which, <laughs> left me feeling kind of guilty. Excellent. Right. I'm sure there are more, more questions. I just want to deal with this system maintenance that, has, that always happens mm. when we do events. There's another question out here. Yes? Or am I seeing things? This is your opportunity. Can I ask one question? Absolutely. We've been trying to find regions, rural or otherwise, that have tried to ask some of these big questions heading into it. We have strong co-location efforts in our business sector. Cortex Innovation Community is internationally known. We're one of the big startup cities. We understand some of these principles. We've just not done them well in the social sector. Our arts community led this process years ahead of the rest of us in their ability and understanding to be creative. It was so cool to learn from them. But when we looked outside, we are having a hard time finding regions that sat down to wrestle through these questions systematically. Are we just blind, or is this not happening as much elsewhere? That is an excellent question. And if you're out there on the live stream as well and have answers, please chime those on in. But anybody here in the room? There's a lot of head shaking. I think, I think these issues need to be wrestled with on a regional basis for sure. But I don't think it's something that we've spent a lot of time doing. Mm. I think um, when it comes to collaboration and place and space, I don't think we've put the time in to be as intentional as we need to be. So I'm really excited to see what comes of this work in St. Louis. And I want some of those tools. Sure, happy, we're happy to share them. I think <laughs> we're required to in, in follow on blogs, are we not? I'm, I'm, I was committing to that, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. There will continue, we will continue to hear from speakers throughout. The, the coming weeks and months? Um, I just, I think that your question reflects the, uh, you're the opposite of the accidental real estate developer. Like, it's, and that's what, uh, that's what we are. So, um, so I really applaud your efforts. It's amazing. Thanks. I do think we're still accidental in that we're asking people for whom this is not their training or job or role to step in on questions that require specific subject matter expertise and roles. And that can be a tough tension. That's part of why, I don't know about in your community, but we just couldn't do this without our CDFIs, right? They're just key to the consulting and training and other things that help our nonprofits be savvy real estate actors, a sentence we don't normally say, <laughs> right? <laughs> We're trying for that. We couldn't get there without our CDFI and a few other actors. We just have a comment in regards to, to your question. Um, I think the community development sector has underestimated the role of the nonprofit sector and its needs when developing community development planning. So why that hasn't happened. Yeah. OK. Well, thanks for the time. One more? I really appreciate the network model and like how do we structure, how do we connect shared space together? I mean, you know, NCN of course has a role doing that about sort of sharing best practice, but in local communities to be able to provide services. I think particularly around, um, you know, off the, on more of the administrative side about how we're competing it with, with WeWorks of the world and other sort of, in, you know, 
national and global actors trying to provide this space with great seamless models for their members or, or renters to use. And so how do you, you know, using that as an overlay, you know, using your model to, and I think, Netta, I think you've thought about this too, about how do you, how does Open GovHub help host for other co-working spaces so that we can actually compete in that environment? So that like, not only can you go to St. Louis, but what happens when you go to DC and go mm -hmm. lobby, right? Mm -hmm. Right. If your organization does do lobbying, of course, under its C4. Yeah, and we're often pulling down, at least regional, for us Midwest, and sometimes national expertise, but in the end, who we're accountable to are very specific neighborhoods, very specific populations. And one of our concerns about bringing in national actors is who are they accountable to? We're struggling enough on our own right to be accountable to our communities, and we live in them, and we're close to them, right? And the structures can be created at that level for governance. Um, and so we're, str we're struggling with some of those same questions. Excellent. Well, everyone, give, join me in a round of applause for Paul.